like to officially welcome you to our Rendezvous Africa and today we're going to be discussing a very exciting topic that is green hydrogen in Africa. Uh, before I hand over to the REN21 Executive Director, Rana, to kick us off officially, I'd just like to remind everybody of our hashtag, which is hashtag Africa. Please feel free to use it on your social media handlers, handles. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Ayman to just pop it in the chat as well. Invite somebody to come and join the conversation. We've got some exciting speakers and this is a fantastic topic to, to delve into. Now, without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rana Adib, who's the Executive Director of REN21, to give the opening remarks. Rana, over to you. Thank you very much, Rufaru, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, warm welcome to another Rendezvous Africa. It's, uh, I just said it, here in Paris, uh, we had sunny weather. Today is raining, and uh, the energy comes from the outlook to have another Great discussion with all of you. So um, I think just for the ones who might be new to this space, um, why are we doing this? Uh, we have started this Rendezvous Africa series because uh, the reality is that um, there are many important um, discussions ongoing, decisions ongoing, um, and we see that uh, there is a diversity of perspectives, basically, on what does renewable energy mean for the African continent? Um, um, how do we drive economic development, industrialization, energy access? Uh, do we go for a fossil fuel route or an energy access, uh, a renewable energy route, etc.? And um, I think we have been, uh, we had already quite exciting discussions and um, really created the space for players to exchange and I guess like also exchange beyond um, what an institutional voice is. And so I'm very, very much looking forward to have a discussion today on hydrogen. Um, why hydrogen, renewable-based hydrogen on the African continent has been a topic which has come up um, a lot during the different rendezvous. We had uh, recent ones on um, natural gas versus renewable energy on the African Green Deal. Um, but also very much in the beginning, when we kicked off this series, uh, we there was this question out there, what does renewable energy mean for the African continent? And interestingly, we had uh, voices from, uh, from, let's say, Egypt, for instance, Namibia, where it was very clear that uh, today, in the current discussions, renewable energy is not only about energy access, it is about opportunities to drive economic uh, development, um, to, to drive expert markets, industrialization, et cetera. And I think this is, these are really the areas we want to, we want to uh, discuss. We also want to see how we can really, especially in the current geopolitical situation, um, make it happen and make it happen in a way that there are benefits for the different players. So I'm really excited to have this um, topic as, a, as the focus of this rendezvous. I invite all of you to use this space we have here, the chat function to participate in the discussions, you will also have the possibility to join basically um, our panel discussion later. So please use this space. I think um, this is exactly what it's about, is uh, hearing the voices, exchanging perspectives. And um, I, without further ado, I'm basically going to ask a poll to join me here on this virtual space uh, to kick us off with a short lightning talk. Um, Paul Nudura is uh, Nuduhura, sorry, <laughs> I was better when training than now, but well, uh, is from the UN University. He's a researcher there and um, his approach to hydrogen is very clearly that we also need new types of leadership approaches um, that are socially, fiscally and environmentally sensitive. And uh, Paul, welcome here. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to hear more about your views on this before moving to the panel discussions. Thank you. Many thanks, Rena, and um, thanks to the RAIN21 team. And um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm sure in Africa, it's probably still in the afternoon now. So, um, <clears throat> so let me just share my screen as, as I start my talk to... Thanks, Rana, again, and... Um, Again, my name is Paul Nduhura and I work with the United Nations University. I'm based in Bonn. 
um, in Germany. The institute that I work with is the, the Institute for Environment and Human Security, um, and particularly um, the program that's called Pan-African um, Cooperation and Education Technologies. Um, where we address topics with regard to uh, that, that discuss the intersection between water, energy, food, and, and, and climate change nexus. And I think this is the reason why um, um, the RAIN21 team asked me to give this, um, um, this lightning talk. Um, and to start us off, I, I really want to start by saying that um, I think the discussion about green hydrogen today is um, it's not so much whether we need hydrogen. I think it is um, so much what contribution green hydrogen can make um, to the global energy transition. As a matter of fact, I think hydrogen is already being used widely uh, in many industries around the world. So to now tap into the potential that hydrogen has uh, to facilitate uh, a clean energy transition or a transition to cleaner energy is I think what, uh, what the main question is today. And talking about um, clean energy transition from the perspective of green hydrogen, it's important that we look at the different facets or the different uh, parts of hydrogen with regard to how it can be produced. So from where um, hydrogen can come from will determine whether um, it's considered green or it's considered um, uh, gray or blue or, or, or turquoise. And again, to say here that there are four main color codes that have been proposed uh, based on the IRENA report where green hydrogen uh, production processes are stipulated. So when you're looking at green hydrogen, sorry, when you're looking at hydrogen, not green hydrogen, when you're looking at hydrogen production um, from coal um, and methane, it's largely now being referred to as gray hydrogen. And the reason for this definitely is because um, there's a lot of CO2 emission that is involved. But then when you look at the other end um, on green hydrogen, this is hydrogen that is coming basically from, uh, from renewable energy electricity. So these color codes are really powerful tools to communicate um, um, the contribution that hydrogen will have in the future of, of the energy transition. And again, hydrogen has uh, super unique qualities um, that make it a powerful tool for, for supporting the energy transition globally. Um, and its contributions are enormous, not only to the energy sector, but to other, to other sectors. And just to highlight a few, um, of course, we know that green hydrogen strength is in its ability to support um, renewable energy integration. So where you have intermittent wind or solar renewable energy, sorry, hydrogen could come in um, as, as, a, as a support with regard to energy storage and so on. But also it's, since it's, it's easy to transport or since it could be made easy to transport, then it's, um, it can facilitate also cross-sector movement of energy. Um, so, and, and also from, from one region to another. Um, then of course, its cross-sector credentials also relate much more to uh, decarbonizing the transport sector um, and the industrial sector, especially with regard to, um, to high temperature heat, heat requirements. But also um, hydrogen has this potential to be used as a chemical tool, so as a feedstock um, in many industrial processes. So for example, industries where methane is required or methanol is required, urea for, for fertilizer production. There is a lot of potential in that regard with regard to hydrogen. So kind of to paint this picture that hydrogen has a bigger contribution that it will make, not only to the energy transition, but to the broader, um, to the broader economic development. Um, and you may ask, uh, why is it that this debate on hydrogen is coming up today? Um, on, since the last few years. I think when you look at the recent uh, years, there are multiple factors that, that have come together really to drive this interest in, in, high, in low carbon hydrogen, but specifically in green hydrogen. Um, and this is related basically to, um, to the climate action debate that is ongoing. So the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think the recent IPCC report uh, mentioned that um, we need to cap greenhouse gas emissions within the next three years uh, if we are going to be able to, to move towards meeting the, the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree target. So green hydrogen, again, is being seen as one of the, um, the key links in this, in this transition or in this climate action. 
Uh, but also more importantly now than ever before, it's, it's the need for energy independence globally, but also in Africa. Of, at a global scale, of course, we all have heard of what's going on with the, with the conflict in, between Russia and Ukraine and the implication it's having on, on, on energy markets and, and supply of oil and gas from, from, from these countries. So definitely there's this you know, stronger need now that uh, countries want to become more energy independent and, and be able to um, to utilize energy resources that they can produce locally. Um, but also green hydrogen is being driven because of the rapidly falling costs of renewable energy technologies. Talk about solar, talk about wind, but also um, recent incursions into discussions on, 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 on carbon capture and storage and so on. Um, so quite, uh, you know, interesting factors that are driving this hydrogen debate, even though hydrogen has been there for, for many years um, of recent, now it's picking up because of, this, of, of these factors. But also the versatility has already mentioned that hydrogen could be used in diverse sectors, not only in the energy sector, but also in industries, in transport and so on. And for Africa, it's even more important. There are, there are factors that are really, I think, are specific to Africa and um, which will drive you know, development on the African continent. And these are related mostly to economic growth. What opportunities are there if a green hydrogen um, economy is, is developed? Opportunities uh, for youth and for women, and especially to spy innovation on the continent. And of course, there's also a chance that Africa could use hydrogen to diversify its energy supply, but also importantly, to quicken um, decentralized energy access for off-grid communities. Um, Again, we have already mentioned about the potential that it has for emissions reduction and decarbonization potential on the African continent, as well as the, the energy security goals for the continent. Um, I know also that there are many African countries drive is to achieve um, this leading export status. And this, this could be an opportunity for Africa to link in since, as you'll see in the, in the coming slides, um, Africa has a bigger, bigger potential for, 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 green, energy, for green hydrogen production. And this is what I was, I was talking about. So let's look at where most of, of the green hydrogen could come from, or if you want, low carbon hydrogen could come from um, today. Um, I've, I've looked at the low carbon hydrogen because the debate is still about whether we should only focus on green hydrogen or we should also look at low carbon hydrogen, especially hydrogen from, um, from natural gas, but with carbon capture and storage. So looking at a global scale, uh, there are many countries with competitive advantage um, competitive advantage with regard to the resources that they have for hydrogen production. But of course, I think our focus is, is more on Africa. And what's outstanding for Africa is its, its potential for green hydrogen production. So the resources in most of these African countries are optimum. They are optimum, whether you talk about solar, whether you talk about wind, um, and in, in some cases, when you talk about hydropower, it's optimum for production of a lot um, of, of, of greenhouse, of, of, of green hydrogen, not only for local use, but for export. Um, and also I was looking at one report by, by Irena, which also tried to show from the economic terms, what does green hydrogen production mean in Africa? Will Africa's hydrogen production be competitive in the future? And um, I think a projection into the, uh, to 2050 shows that just considering sub-Saharan Africa alone, it will have the most potential for producing green hydrogen under 1.5 under 1.5 US dollars per kilogram. So most of the potential is in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in, in, in the Middle East and North African countries. There's a lot of potential where hydrogen could be produced at a low cost, which makes it competitive on the world market. Um, but then the question then comes, where is the current momentum? Um, we have seen the potential on the African continent, but what's happening now when you look at what's going on over the last few years, where is the momentum towards a green hydrogen future? And I just wanted to show here uh, the countries across the globe where there is movement with regard to developing national hydrogen strategies. So policy documents that are really important for kickstarting the green hydrogen future. And of course, there are many countries in the global north that have already um, hydrogen strategies developed or those that are in preparation. Uh, but we don't see much when it comes to the African continent. Um, in Africa, I think the early leaders have been South Africa, 
and, and Morocco, who already have national hydrogen strategies available. Uh, South Africa um, released its, its national hydrogen roadmap, I think, um, in February, that spells out um, how it wants its, its green hydrogen future to, to look like, or its hydrogen future to look like. But we also, that know, we also know that in countries like Namibia and, and, and Egypt, and also in, in, in Mauritania, that there's been discussions um, around green hydrogen in, in Tunisia as well, but we don't see a lot of movement in the, for example, in the East African countries and so on and so forth. But just to show you that, um, yes, there is a lot of potential in Africa, but then uh, the momentum is not yet there, at least with regard to, uh, to you know, commitments to, to a green hydrogen future. What we also see with regard to, to current momentum is um, the bilateral relationships between countries. Um, especially to promote cooperation with regard to green hydrogen. So we see that um, for the sake of Africa, there are a few that are highlighted here. So Nigeria and Morocco, Tunisia, but of course you could add South Africa, Namibia, where there has been kind of a government to government bilateral relations with, with countries, especially in the global north, to drive the green hydrogen uh, potential. But I, I should say here that most of this um, seems to be geared uh, to providing, to generating hydrogen from, from Africa and then transferring it to to the global north. Um, I think it's still yet to be clear how uh, these countries will tackle uh, the local demand for green hydrogen in the future. Um, just to move quickly also and uh, get to wrap up, I also wanted to paint a quick picture of, of how um, Africa is participating in the global hydrogen debate with regard to um, already ongoing um, green hydrogen initiatives. Yeah? So participation in, in the debate, how is Africa being represented? Um, in this in these global initiatives, you don't see again. You don't see much of African representation. That's for sure. And just to highlight, maybe the last one at the recent COP twenty six um, in in Glasgow, there was this you know broader breakthrough agenda that was that was um, that was launched. And specifically, there was a fourth a breakthrough on, on hydrogen. And only a few, a handful of African countries actually endorsed this this agenda, which which sought to to ensure that there is affordable, renewable, and low-cost, um, low-carbon hydrogen by 2030. So again, just to mention that African involvement, even at a global stage, in shaping the debate, uh, in shaping the discussion on green hydrogen, is, is still, I should say, uh, unfortunately, minimal, but hopefully it will pick up, not only on intergovernmental or policy discussion, but with regard to research, with regard to business-to-business -business interactions. And um, so in, in various sectors, we don't see much again um, in, in um, much of Africa's involvement. Um, so um, I think I'm coming to the last one or two slides uh, of, um, of my presentation. Here, I just wanted to highlight where, when you look at globally at the green hydrogen, at the hydrogen strategies that have been uh, released by, by countries, it seems to paint a, a picture of um, three development phases for realizing a green hydrogen future. And currently to say that we are in the first phase, which is uh, largely until 2030. And this phase is called the activation phase. So this is a phase where we have potential for demonstration, piloting, research and development and so on and so forth. And this is very important for the market growth phase that will come later and also for the maturity phase that will come uh, say post 2040 or, or post 2050. And I want to really mention here that if Africa is not um, well represented or well engaged in the market activation phase, it will definitely be problematic when it comes to 2030, uh, the market growth phase. Uh, Africa may not be ready or many African countries may not be prepared for when those opportunities for growth and multiplication will come. So just to say that it is important that uh, we Africa does not miss out on, on engagement um, from the very, very beginning. And um, just a few highlights of what I thought are important hurdles that still remain with regard to deployment of green hydrogen in Africa. I'm not going through to go through the whole list, but I think one that I should highlight is the second one on, on low electricity access. I think it's, 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 it remains an issue to justify green hydrogen production for, um, for example, for the export market when electricity access rates on the continent are still very low. That would be very contentious. Um, but also, if you see over the last 10 years, development in green hydrogen generation, on Africa has contributed only 2% of, of, of global renewable energy generation capacity. That is quite low. And, and I think for you to go for green hydrogen um, 
generation, large scale, renewable energy generation capacity should, should, should increase greatly in, on the continent. And I hope this is something that can be addressed. Um, but of course, can also talk about the huge infrastructure needs that, that are still prevalent. We've already talked about the lack of, 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 of policy frameworks um, that can produce, that can um, support green hydrogen projects. So that one we already highlighted, but also um, how much knowledge is there in Africa, how much research, how much training with regard to hydrogen is ongoing. Apart from South Africa, which has this, um, this, this HAIS, HIS a plan, Hydrogen South Africa plan, where they promote demonstration and so on. In most of the other countries, you will not find a lot, apart from Morocco as well. But we need to scale up knowledge, research, and training to prepare the local capacity for, uh, for, for a green hydrogen future. And maybe the sticky issues that are still prevalent, um, that are not necessarily conventional. I think it's the issue of ownership. So questions will arise. Who is um, owning the green hydrogen in Africa? That should be discussed. I think also in this in this panel discussion, in this panel discussion, and also by all the participants. And I should also mention that I think um, the issues of water stress and land use are also not mentioned a lot because green hydrogen relies a lot on, you know, electrolysis of water. Um, what will it mean for water access rights? What will it mean for countries like Niger where there is already high water stress? Um, but also issues um, such as asset stranding. There is need for a transition, say, for, for fossil fuel fossil fuel exporting countries like Nigeria. How can they transition uh, from fossil fuels to hydrogen without, you know, without a lot of consequences for their economy and the society? Um, and lastly, here on, on the point that I called green colonialism. This is where uh, there is a risk that people in Africa could perceive this, you know, demand, this huge demand for green hydrogen from the global north as another form of colonialism, what we call green colonialism, to say that you're coming to take our resources um, uh, to the global north and, and we don't see much benefit from that. So again, to say that these are, um, these are other issues that still need to be discussed and then um, this, if, if, if the future of green hydrogen in Africa is going to be smooth, um, then, then these ones have to be discussed. And so again, this is my last slide. And um, just to highlight three points that I think you could take already from the discussion. Um, one, I, I say it's engage, engage, engage. We have seen that um, Africans' engagement on the global scale with regard to green hydrogen is not, is not a lot as, as of today. So it's important that Africa is seen to participate, to shape the debate already, to shape the direction of, of where green hydrogen development will, will be. Because for me, there is, I don't see a future of green hydrogen um, without Africa playing a major role. Secondly, of course, to prepare not only with, uh, with, with plans, uh, green hydrogen strategies, but also build local capacity, train local resources, train local human resources. And, and lastly, it is think local fast. I think this, is, this will be very critical to think um, fast to use, to produce green hydrogen for the local market, to meet local needs before you think of, okay, this, this huge export market, this huge demand uh, from the global north. First think of how can green hydrogen solve a local problem? How can it be used to support decentralized energy access? Um, and I think this will be very critical because with this, you can pilot a few, a few projects and then use it uh, for purposes of, of, you know, of launching now for, for a bigger export market. Um, so let me end here and um, thank you for the REN21 team and for, uh, for the, all the participants for listening. And I'm looking forward to, to the debate, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. 